Good morning and Happy New Year. Welcome to NASA headquarters and our post-flight briefing with the space shuttle crew of STS-129, the 31st flight of the space shuttle to the International Space Station. I'm Alan Ladwick from the Office of Communication. I'm your host today. In addition to the employees from NASA headquarters, we welcome some very special guests who are here in the audience this morning, the teachers and students from the Congressional Schools of Virginia, the Edmund Burke School of Washington, D.C., and the, fir and the First District Community Outreach Youth Group of Washington, D.C. Since President Obama announced the administration's Educate to Innovate campaign last week, it's especially appropriate that we have so many teachers and students here with us today. The Educate to Innovate initiative is designed to improve the participation and performance of America's students in science, technology, uh, engineering, and math. This campaign will include efforts not only from the federal government and agencies such as NASA, but also from leading companies, foundations, nonprofit organizations who are going to work to help students become more adept at science and math. With only one U.S. module left to install at the International Space Station, the STS-129 mission was devoted to the delivery of equipment and materials that will enable increased and efficient utilization of the station capabilities once assembly is complete later this year. Commander Charlie Hobah led the STS-129 mission aboard the Space Shuttle Atlantis. For you students in the audience looking for role models, you have to go no further than to listen to Charlie and his fellow crew members. They are concrete evidence of the value of dedicated training, teamwork, and a demonstration of what can happen when one follows their dreams. So please join me in extending a warm and rousing headquarters welcome to Commander Charlie Hoba, who will introduce the members of his crew. Thanks, Alan, and good morning. It's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be standing in front of you to be able to relay some of the joys, thrills, excitement that we had during our mission and uh, the things we do is a, uh, it's really car hard to call a job. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce uh, my pilot first, uh, Captain Barry Wilmore. We uh, <laughs> affectionately refer to him as Butch, uh, former A-7 and F-18 pilot, test pilot, uh, in fact, Butch and I were at Pax River together, so I've known Butch for quite a long time. Uh, next, uh, Leland uh, Velvet Melvin. <laughs> Leland has the, uh, the distinction of not only being a, a superb uh, mission specialist, but of course uh, having a background uh, in pro football uh, and of course high school football. Both these guys uh, had football backgrounds in college and and uh, squared off against one another a couple times on orbit. Hopefully, we'll see a little bit of that. Next, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Randy Bresnick, call him Comrade. <laughs> F-18 pilot uh, in the Marine Corps, fellow Marine uh, friend of mine. Uh, also a uh, um, uh, test pilot background. Uh, that, that's, uh, if you're keeping track, that's three so far. Uh, next, uh, Captain uh, Mike Foreman. Also, went to one of the finest uh, institutions of higher learning known to man the U.S. Naval Academy uh, <laughs> a few years before me. He's the, the, uh, the most seasoned uh, member of our crew in years only, I think. So. <laughs> and uh, rounding it out, uh, we got Bobby Satcher, uh, Ph.D., <laughs> Bobby, Bobby was a, uh, a medical doctor and thought he'd be another kind of doctor. He also uh, got a PhD. So uh, from, from right to left or left to right, depending on your vantage point, uh, we go from the least educated to the most educated, which is Bobby. So uh, with that, we'll all sit down. We will uh, show you our video. Start off, we had the uh, Space Shuttle Atlantis. Uh, it was a uh, 
a beautiful day in November. Suit up room is uh, myself, Butch, Mike getting his uh, suit ready to go, Bobby, Comrade, and lastly, Leland. Everybody's cool, cool calm, collected, and ready to go. Walk out through the hallway, uh, getting prepped for the uh, downstairs portion, which is the I Love Leland Melvin fan club. <laughs> you can, you, yeah, you can, you can hear the fans in the background. We uh, ride out, out to the pad. It's probably the first time we've ever been out to the space shuttle where there's uh, nobody there but ourselves, and uh, there's a, uh, the suit-up guys that, uh, that get us inside the vehicle. It's pretty, uh, it's almost lonely, uh, pretty serene. Uh, we get into the white room, which is where we put our final items of clothing on. You can see the, uh, it kind of escalates in a little bit more fun and uh, ends up with a guy that uh, just can't break the cord. <laughs> One guy whose wife was having a baby on her. Stood up in the mid-deck? No, that's whining. Uh, get flight deck and mid-deck all, all uh, strapped in together. We get in there about two and a half to three hours prior, so we're laying on our backs for quite a while. Processing launch teams. Wish you good luck, Godspeed. We'll see you back here just after Thanksgiving. We're excited to take this incredible vehicle for a ride, meet up with another incredible vehicle, the International Space Station. So, with that, thank you very much for all you've done, and everybody across the country that's participated, we're ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Sound suppression water system activated. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 3, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff of Space Shuttle Atlantis on a mission to build, resupply, and to do research on the International Space Station. Pretty exciting uh, first couple of minutes. You, you sit there, you, everybody's really uh, kind of rested and peaceful, and then towards the very end, you start cranking, getting things going, and uh, you can you can tell you're going. Uh, as soon as those SRBs light, uh, you know you're going somewhere in a hurry. Speaking of the solids, you get up to about 150,000 feet. Solids are, the propellant's completely gone, so you want to get rid of that extra weight in those canisters. So those canisters come off, like I said, about 150, and you continue on uphill. For another couple of minutes, about Mach 13, about 300 plus thousand feet, you finally get to the point where you do a roll to heads up, where you start bouncing your communication signals. Instead of back off the ground, you bounce them off of satellites, and this is what's taking place right here as we roll to heads up. And then eight and a half minutes after it starts, the engine's cut off, and then you separate from the external tank, and you are there. You go from a light blue at launch, and eventually it just sort of fades to black, and it gets darker, and it's just a miraculous thing to watch as you get up and uh, start look, you know, looking out the window at the blackness of space. And then right after we got right out, we pulled out a camera just to show each other in our orange suits. Eventually, we open those payload bay doors so we can start cooling the vehicle down. And we have to do a couple of burns to circularize our orbit. And you can see a uh, fire off these burns. And you'll see those ohms in orbital maneuvering system engines in the back just glowing brightly. Just a beautiful, beautiful sight. Meanwhile, down on the mid deck, uh, we're kind of chaos down here, getting out of our orange suits and uh, putting everything away. You can see we just have bags everywhere for a while until we get everything stowed back where it needs to go. I'm kind of lost down here underneath this. Uh, piece of equipment, Bobby's playing with a drink bag there, getting out some checklists. This is flight day two now. We're actually getting ready to inspect the vehicle's tiles to make sure we didn't have any damage during our launch. Good looking butch there. So you, these guys are pulling out the robotic arm and uh, I don't know why I talk about this because I didn't, I'm the only guy on the crew that wasn't allowed to talk, touch the robotic arms. I was down shaving and here's butch, he's got the electric version and Randy was exercising. And then we have these uh, big spacewalk suits that we're going to use eventually. We take those out of the airlock, stow them, and of course there's always time for stupid astronaut food tricks.
Butch needed something to do, so we told him to blow up this football. The uh, third day we're on orbit is uh, is dedicated to just finding station, getting there, and uh, getting prepped for our spacewalk, which is the next day. So it's a very busy day. Uh, when we launch, the space station is almost three quarters of the way around the Earth away from us. So we go into lower orbit and catch up to them with a uh, with a, our lower orbit being faster. Um, Space Station just gets bigger and bigger for those full three days to where uh, we rendezvous from up underneath it, do this uh, pitch maneuver, which is really to just expose the underside of our vehicle to see if we had any type of potential uh, thermal protection system damage, and usually it's, it's pretty clean, uh, but it's one last check, uh, and this is what it looks like coming out the uh, back end of it when we see the uh, station again. We're basically blind on it, of course, as we're uh, underneath it uh, with the tile exposed, uh, but this is the eventual end of that maneuver. Uh, still underneath, uh, we get to within uh, about 500 feet before we transition to directly out in front of it, and this is an inset that actually shows the, uh, the space station and, uh, and our mating interface coming together. And then we'll show you a little cockpit view of the, the very terminal phase here of, of the, uh, the mating. Ready with the timer? Ready. Got that coast to noon. 18 inches. Nine inches. Ready? Two inches. Fire. That's the initial contact. We got captured. Capture. Everything we do is a, is a team effort. It's uh, all individuals working together. It's never just one person. So that's really the, the fun part of it is just working together as a crew. What we were as a crew of six, now once we get to station and get the hatches up, we're now a crew of 12. And most of these guys we haven't really had a chance to work with in training. We train very well together as a group of six. They train as a group of six. And uh, now we're 12 to do this next So part after, of after docking to the station, we had to uh, get to work with robotics. Uh, here's Butch moving the, we call it the Waffle 1 and Waffle 2. They look like waffle cones. But they have a lot of uh, about 30,000 pounds of spare parts that we're putting onto the space station. Express Logistics Carrier 1, which attached it to the uh, station, to the truss. And robotics is kind of like playing a big video game. Sometimes you don't have any window views to look out of, especially on the space station side. So you have to do everything with, with camera views. How many video game players are in here? OK, got quite a few. So you'd be great robotic arm operators. <laughs> But uh, we had to use the arm also to, the, the shuttle arm, to grapple the ELC 1 and 2. And then we take it out of the payload bay. You see it there, lots of spare parts on it. And then we have to hand this off to the station arm, the bigger arm. We call it the SSRMS. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a much bigger arm, much more capable arm than the smaller arm on the shuttle. And here we go. We're grappling. So we're driving the arm into the, uh, to the grapple fixture. And then the, uh, the space station arm goes away goes into a viewing position, and now we're going to install ELC-2. And it's, uh, it's a very, very tight tolerances, very difficult times, and uh, it was a very a lot of fun. We did want to take an opportunity to give you a little tour of the inside of the station. This is obviously video that's sped up uh, quite a bit, a little it, shaky. A sped up? Yeah, it's sped up a tad, yeah. This is the Russian segment looking in the various modules down in the docking department up to the newest module called MRM-2, and then turning around through the functional cargo block and then see the guys doing a little work, uh, getting prepped for their spacewalks. On through the lab, by the space potty there. See the guys into node two, getting closer to where we're docked to the station. We'll look uh, right into th to the Columbus module and then back to the left, we're looking at the Japanese experimental module. Then we'll turn our way around and then back through the shuttle's airlock, which is where we obviously dock to the station making a lot of turns into the mid deck. See our commander there doing some water ops. Up to the flight deck. And all told, it's you know, longer than a football field, so quite a, quite a lot of ground we covered there in about uh, 20 seconds. So we were getting ready for our three spacewalks for the mission, and you can see us moving one of those spacewalk suits. We call that an EMU, that big white suit that we wear when we go outside uh, into the airlock and getting ready, and then uh, here uh, we are just about to start suiting up for EVA number one, first spacewalk. There's me getting in my suit. Bobby's getting his helmet on there. And EVA stands for extravehicular activity. That's what, that's what we call spacewalks. 
So uh, we get in these suits and uh, everybody checks to make sure they're all latched and, and buttoned up real tight. And we go outside and uh, on EVA number one, our first goal was to uh, take this spare antenna that we had taken up in our payload bay and transfer that over to the space station. So that's me down in the payload bay, um, taking the, un loosening the bolts on this antenna and Bobby's coming over. He's riding the end of the robotic arm there and he's coming down into the payload bay so he can take this antenna once it's unbolted and transport it over to the space station. Butch and Leland are working hard there on the video game, driving him around. Here's Bobby taking hold of that thing and moving away. And then I met him over on the other side, on the space station side, and we bolted it in. And there's a great view of Bobby. Yeah, so Randy was inside kind of directing all of this and uh, coming up on the uh, robotic arm where we were actually uh, doing some lubing, putting some grease in there so that uh, you can see the wire mechanism moving there. But this gives you a sense of what it looked like outside. It's uh, In outer space, it's actually vacuum, so there's no air. That's why we have to get into the uh, space suits for the, for the space walks. But it's a really spectacular view. And there I am again uh, doing the same thing over on another robotic arm. So then that was uh, the first spacewalk. And then the second spacewalk was uh, Mike and I going out, my first time. Um, and you see uh, how much effort it takes, a couple people to suit us up each time, get our tools on us, get prepped to go outside the door. Uh, our second spacewalk was moving some antennas around, doing some more work with our uh, um, uh, express logistics carriers. We also uh, installed a few other items uh, outboard the European module. So a bunch of uh, ex external work that allows the station to have better capability in the future. Um, you can see some of these views. It's pretty amazing. If you saw my NASA TV, the views from our helmet cams, there's a view of the commander in the window of the space shuttle looking from the uh, EVA person's point of view. And while we call it spacewalking, you can see that we don't use our legs for anything except to hold us in a foot restraint. It's really all walking with your hands. So you're, you're working with your hands for all your tools and everything that you're working with is you also need to walk everywhere. So that's why it does get tiring because the only thing you're using is your hands. And with the spacesuit inflated like it is, you're always fighting the inflation um, every time you want to close your hands. So that's one of the things and why we train so long and hard for uh, spacewalks to get in uh, condition for that. You can see with no gravity to help you fall out of the suit, you need a little help from your friends helping you get out. And we call this one kind of like birthing the baby cow as uh, <laughs> Butch has to stand on Mike's legs and then hold the arms up and try and push him out because there's no force, i.e. gravity, to help him fall out. Because my upper arms are so muscular, they want to stay <laughs> But uh, while the spacewalks are going on, there's a host of people. You saw the people inside. They're reading the script. You got the robotics folks that are moving the arm. You got, uh, uh, you know, the commander. His job was to be overall goalie and keep track of everything that was going on, and and also do some other events. Then, uh, for the last spacewalk, Mike uh, took the training wheels off Bobby and I, and we got to go out together. Mike was now uh, the guy inside doing the IV, um, while Bobby and I went out there for the last spacewalk of the flight. And the big goal on this one was after we installed some uh, science platforms uh, out on one of the uh, uh, big cargo platforms, this big, huge 1,200-pound tank you see in front of you, we basically, Bobby and I pulled that off the uh, cargo platform, turned it so that the robotics folks could, could grab it with the space station arm. So that was a pretty, pretty neat feat. You got this huge thing that weighs a whole bunch we'd never be able to pick up here on Earth, but you'll see how easy it is for Bobby and I just to turn this thing and point the grapple fixture uh, up so the arm could go ahead and grab it. Obviously, when you're moving something that massive, you move kind of slow and, and deliberate. And uh, Leland and Butch did a great job grabbing it from us. And then our job was to clean up a few things. And then we basically space walked or did our space crawl back to the airlock so we could meet the arm with the tank and then in, put it in its install position. And so throughout all the practice we did in the uh, neutral buoyancy laboratory, in the uh, virtual reality lab, 
were able to fly this thing in space on the robotic arm within inches of the install position, them using their cameras and also the views from Bobby and my helmet cameras, and then Bobby and I put it in place for, its, uh, for it to be able to be used on station. Then after that spacewalk, we got the news that um, my daughter Abigail had been born. I was able to share that good news with the crew with the traditional cigars. Um, no smoking in space, so we had the bubblegum cigars. Uh, we also had a little time to, uh, to play around with the football. That would never happen <laughs> in real life. That was a great <laughs> stint. Never great. happened in real life. That's why Leland left the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, on the serious side, there's a lot of uh, scientific work that, that's going on on the station now. We participate in a lot of the experiments. You can see, uh, you saw some experiments with plants there. We also did some, some cell biology experiments. That's what Leland's doing right there. Um, and we also uh, did some experiments just measuring how much taller you get in outer space. Everybody uh, gets taller when they go in outer space. One of the other things we do in space is we transfer items from the station back to the shuttle, things that have to come back down, like Nicole's shoes and her clothing when she had been in space for three months. So here's Scorch using his legs. There's Comrade actually taking a big payload back over to the station. He's going to do his little uh, Superman maneuver here. Here we go. <laughs> He's taking it up into the uh, top of the gym. Also exercise in space. Here's uh, Butch working, doing some squats. Here's Scorch using the same machine to do bench press. About 10 pounds, I think. There. Yeah, it's about five pounds, I think. <laughs> here's, uh, here's Mike on the uh, cycle ergometer over in the uh, shuttle side. And then here's Jeff running on the Colbert, which is a, a treadmill. The bungees help hold you down, like simulating gravity. Also, uh, delicious food from all over the world. We're sitting here having some, uh, I think these are calf cheeks. Yeah, some <laughs> Russian delicacy. But we're all just kind of sitting around having a good time. Uh, it's, you know, you work hard during the day, you eat and you play hard at night. and just a really good moment to uh, reflect on the day and just all the different cultures and people that we have around the world helping us do this mission. Next, we had our last transfer item, item 914. Nicole getting transferred over from the station to the shuttle. We we're waving goodbye, saying goodbye to everyone, and it was a great moment. Coming back in, Jeff and the two commanders are saying their final goodbyes and uh, coming over, we're gonna close the hatch and get back home. All good things must come to an end, so yeah, eventually we did have to undock. But before we did, when we, after we closed the hatch, had a little fun with water. That's what happens with water when you get in zero G. You stick your nose in it. And then Mike uh, showing off his STS-129 ensemble. And then just prior to undocking, counting down the time, everybody's getting ready. Various roles, as Scorch said earlier, it is a team effort. Um, everything we do, so obviously undocking is as well. I was on the controls, but uh, everybody's got a role that they play very important. Uh, and here we go, uh, just about physical to separation. Houston copies. Station copies. TCS is good. Okay. Which that was a clear. I got LBL legs. You fly out uh, directly in front of the station, and eventually uh, we did a complete fly around. We need to do some photo documentation of the exterior of the station. So we fly completely around the station. Here are the guys, our little sped up video, see how chaotic it is in the overhead windows as everybody's grabbing the candles, ca cameras, doing the photo documentation I just mentioned. Fly around the station at about 600 feet, thereabouts. And you'll see here in the next shot uh, what the station looks like from our vantage point and also a little sped up video there in the box as we flew around. Just beautiful, beautiful views as the contrasting of the gold of the solar rays and the silver of the station itself and the blue earth below with the super black uh, um, universe in the background. It's just, just really beautiful, miraculously beautiful views. As we say goodbye to our, our what was our home for seven days. Eventually we did the burns to, to leave the station and got a, caught a couple of views of the uh, earth below. Also a shot of the moon here coming up as we say bye. Looking out the windows at the curvature of the earth. So we do some more burns to start coming back home. Again, beautiful sights. That's, that's obviously the border between Tennessee and Virginia down there. <laughs> Southern Ohio. 
And there's also stickage in space. Again, fun with water and M&Ms. We've been uh, in space for about uh, 11 days. Now it's time to, to head back. You can see uh, gravity starting to pick up as Leland's showing. He's not dropping his, his uh, list. He's actually just letting go of it. And now it doesn't float in front of him. It actually falls. Uh, Mach 25 was the goal, and we, uh, we hit that pretty well. Uh, otherwise, you don't get this really cool blue patch like Book, Butch has on his uh, chest here. Um, the landing back in Florida was, was great. We came uh, screaming up the coast of, uh, of Florida from south to north uh, to a, a beautiful uh, uh, morning day. A uh, little, little breezy, a little cool, but uh, um, very picturesque. Um, the landing went, went very well. The, uh, you, you go from 0G to 1G, and uh, 1G seems like 4G. Your face starts to sag, and if... Uh, now, if you had any wrinkles, they go away in zero G, but they come right back as soon as you hit the, the gravity environment. Uh, the, the sad thing about this whole event here is uh, is right about uh, entry time is where you think, hey, we you know we had this great crew, we had a great time, and and now it's coming to an end. Kind of uh, ends a ends a little page in your book of uh, true life fun experiences. Uh, after. After getting in, cleaned up a little bit, you get to come out and see all the uh, uh, guys from the top down that, that allowed you to have such a tremendous experience. And then the unique uh, event here is getting to get outside the vehicle you've been living in for 11 days and, and seeing what, uh, what held you up there. So it's really exciting. Well, that was trying to encapsulate uh, 12 days in about 20 minutes. So uh, there's, uh, and, and the, the main thing we tell you too is, uh, you know, the flight, the flight is just the, uh, the culmination of what had been uh, over a year's worth of, of uh, planning and scheduling. And for us, about nine months of, of true dedicated training together as a group, just to be able to pull off those 12 days. And uh, the thing, the thing that's really amazing is, uh, you know, the, the flight itself is over in the blink of an eye, but the true life experiences that you, you come to enjoy is just the, the teamwork and working together as a group, getting ready, and, uh, and then just executing something as fun as a space flight. Uh, with that, uh, we'd like to open it up to questions you guys might have. Um, I guess there are a couple. And can we kill, uh, dim these lights just a little bit so we can see who's asking the questions? Go ahead, first one, I saw some uh, hands in the back. <laughs> right, the question was, what fabric do they use to make the uh, spacewalk suits? I'll let Mike answer that. Well, this, those suits are, are, you know, they have to be their own little uh, personal spaceship, basically, because they have to protect us from the vacuum of space and the extreme temperatures that we're going to experience out there. So. There are multiple layers of fabric. The inner, the innermost uh, fabric is is sort of a bladder rubber material to keep the pressure that we have inside there, inside. And then there are layers of fabric on the outside to protect that that inner uh, fabric from uh, anything outside that you know we might brush up against. Uh, but it is a pretty amazing uh, piece of equipment. It provides us the cooling that we need. Uh, the oxygen, obviously, the uh, communication so that we can talk to everybody on the ground and, and back inside. So pretty neat, uh, pretty neat, neat uh, thing. Uh, during the video, you mentioned uh, the various modules that there was in the space station. Do you know how many there was exactly? Which ran out of fingers to count yeah. that one, I'm sorry. Depends on how you count. The, uh, the Soyuz could be counted as a single module, but it actually has two parts to it. So if you counted both parts as a separate module, I mean, you'd come up with one, two, three, four, five, six, I'll seven, you, right eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, See, fourteen. People from Tennessee can count. And that's a wag. That's a quick count. Fourteen-ish, <laughs> including the shuttle. 
And it, it's a it's a really good question you asked. And, and the, the thing to mention is it's not just modules that come up, but it's also ex, external parts. In other words, all those trust pieces, like uh, at least in my experience, uh, the first flight we had, we really didn't have much other than a single solar array uh, mounted on top of the lab. And actually, that that's kind of a lie, but essentially that's that's what we had. Now, over the, over the flights, in addition to building the modules and the pressurized volume inside, you also had flight after flight to give you all the power generation, thermal rejection capability, and cooling that you required to keep the, the station up and living and breathing through that whole time. So every, every flight that we do is usually packed with, with tens of thousands of pounds of equipment. In our case, we had almost 30,000 pounds that we delivered to the station. So the numerous flights that we take up, you know, every one of them is, is uh, jam-packed with equipment. And, and the amazing part of the, those 14, you know, different items are talking about, plus all the extra trust and everything scorch you're talking about, they weren't all built in the same place. And so it was like you making something at your school and the kids over here from another school making something and have, going, taking it, you know, on the other side of the planet and fitting it together and have it all work. And that's the amazing part about the International Space Station, that stuff built on the other side of the planet, it's that everybody's doing the same engineering and taking the drawings and making the stuff the exact tolerances that we can go up into space, put it together, and it all works. Um, how many gallons of fuel does it take to launch the spaceship? You know, I don't, I don't know the exact number, but I do know that the propellant that is flowing into the three main engines from the, on the back end of the space shuttle, it, every second is about equal to the size of a standard swimming pool. So you've got that much propellant, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, flowing at very, very high rates. You've got 17 inch valves on each side, the hydrogen side and the oxygen side that is routed to those three engines. And it's pretty remarkable how much propellant does flow in it and it works fantastic. And so for the eight and a half minutes to orbit, that's about a little over 500 seconds, that's 500 swimming pools worth of fuel. Yeah. What kind of training did you do? Wow. I, I'm training. trying to think, that's a, that's, a, that's a loaded question. You don't, even, you don't even know how expansive that one is. Uh, Bobby, you wanna try that one? Uh, well, it depends on uh, what, what your role is specifically, because uh, we all work as a team, so uh, we divide it up to different uh, tasks. Uh, some of us, of, of course, uh, you know, we're responsible for flying the spaceship, the commander and pilot. Others of us were uh, basically doing things like spacewalks, others uh, doing the robotic operations, and then there's a whole bunch of other activities that go on on the spaceship that uh, different people are responsible for. That you, you know, you saw some of that in the movie when we were actually docking to the space station and undocking. So we train for all of that stuff, um, all of the specific tasks. We also just uh, do some training just to get used to each other as a team. So uh, it's almost like, you know, to some extent, almost like a sports team, getting used to each other, um, get, knowing what uh, you know our strengths, weaknesses are, and understanding how to manage everything. What equipment do you use to prepare to go to space? What what equipment do you use to repair things? Yes. We, for the robotics training, we use a lot of computers and a lot of simulation because we don't have um, you know, the actual robotic arm on the ground because it's too heavy, gravity will pull it down. We do have a, a simulated arm that is um, it's, it's, it's about the same size as the, uh, the, the big arm on the space station, but all the stuff that we do is pretty much like a video game, like I mentioned before. So that, that robotics training works like that. The pool that they use, it's a, what is it, a 50 million gallon pool? Six million gallons. Six million gallons. Huge pool for simulating the spacewalks. So when, when Bobby and, and Comrade and uh, Mike are simulating the spacewalks, they're in their white, white suits. But you can't do it. You know, you have to have a microgravity type environment. So you use neutral buoyancy in the water, just like you float in the water to simulate that kind of training. So that's another facility we use. We have, um, a, for the ascent, we have like a motion-based simulator. It's like a big, another big video game where you sit in there and you actually move like you're doing a launch and then you land, it turns down and 
acts like your landing. So lots of different facilities for equipment that we use for our training. Good question. Is that, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, what parts do you, did you deliver to the International Space Station? Who had that too much? <laughs> uh, I'll answer that. Um, these uh, the logistics carriers we had, they were about uh, you know close to thirty thousand pounds with with the weight of the carrier and the the parts. The parts that we delivered were these bitty, uh, real big uh, replaceable units for um, items that are just intended to keep the space station going for a long period of time. Uh, we had a couple control moment gyros, for example, that uh, what these things do are they're big gyroscopes that uh, they're spun up. There's four of them. They're out of, uh, intentionally out of alignment. So as we uh, rotate around the Earth, there's uh, torques that are imparted on these gyroscopes to actually keep the space station in its desired attitude or pointed in the right direction, which is extremely important for having things such as uh, uh, thermal conditioning on the station, if things getting too hot, too cold, but also if you think about the big solar arrays and being able to point them and have them in an orientation where you can get power uh, during the time that you're in a light phase. And as we go around the or uh, Earth, there's, you know, one, uh, one daytime cycle is about 90 minutes. So we see sunrise, sunset, 90 minutes, we have 15 orbits per day on a, on a normal day. So uh, those, those we had. We had uh, pump modules for, for cooling. We brought this high pressure gas tank. We had spare parts for the robotics arms, and uh, the, the list goes on from there. But these were the big, big pieces that uh, would be spacewalk or robotic uh, installed if, if a certain component was to fail and needed to be replaced. So we were basically stocking the station uh, externally with big spare parts, and then we also had a bunch of things internally that that uh, Leland was the master of, of making sure that the, the right uh, spare parts that we transferred inside got to the right place and we brought the right things back. Good question. What inspired you to become an astronaut for NASA? Little Beaver? <laughs> that is a very good question. And, and there's many things that I could answer, but I'll, I'll just pick a few of the things that inspired me personally. Uh, I think growing up watching the space program, uh, it is definitely a unique tasks that we have the opportunity to do as astronauts. And the opportunity to try to strive to be involved and take a, take a role in that, never dreaming that I'd actually be one of the guys sitting on the pointy end of the rocket when it launches. But just to play a role and, uh, and, and be involved in that. I, I truly, when I was your age, I really enjoyed... Uh, technology. I enjoyed learning about things. I learned enjoying how things worked, what made things go. Um, I was very intrigued, and, and I came to learn that a lot of the things technology-wise, there's a lot of math involved, so I became interested in math. I truly did, and I enjoyed learning uh, mathematics and getting on up into ge geometry and um, algebra and trigonometry and calculus and all of those things as I went along. It was really, really intriguing to me. So I think it was the, the big picture of what really inspired me was just learning and taking the opportunity to learn as far as we possibly can. So for me, that was, that was, insp that was what inspired me. What does it feel like in zero gravity? Have you ever been uh, floating in the bath where the temperature is about the same as what your body is and you really can't tell where your body ends and, your, and the water starts? It's something like that because there's, there's no forces on your body and your body just naturally goes when you're not doing something to a position that's comfortable for it. So zero gravity I, I found to be really, really uh, comfortable once you get used to it. Um, because your body just, you know, takes a little bit to adapt to it, but then once it's there, it's like it was meant to be there because it's so easy to move around. And the neat part I found was that, you know, it seemed like we're all wired for it and that anybody could do it. It doesn't take somebody special or, or special training because, you know, our bodies have these accelerometers and these abilities to, to make uh, 
uh, understand sensations. And so if you were pushing off somewhere in zero gravity, you weren't, your eyes were telling you you weren't going exactly where you wanted to go, all you had to do was reach out your hand and your body knew exactly where to put the vector to push off somewhere with just a fingertip to redirect you to fly where you wanted to go. And so that's where it really seemed like it was, you didn't have to be an experienced space flyer to go there because, you know, as first time space flyers for a few of us, it was very, very natural to, you know, um, for your body to go ahead and, and, and do that. And sleeping was just, you know, so comfortable because you didn't have to worry about a pillow or a hot spot on the bed or rolling on your side because you just floated right where your body wanted to be and it was very happy. <laughs> um, what could have gone wrong um, on the liftoff or um, just randomly in space? Who's asking that question? Oh, the adult in the back? <laughs> 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 yeah. Sorry, I was just curious. Um, Million you know, it, things it, could have it, gone wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Three million, to be exact. But, you know, that's a, a lot of people ask. You know, are you uh, are you afraid? Are you uh, are you you know? Do you have any fears as you go up? Are you worried about anything? And uh, the biggest the biggest fear that I think collectively, I guess I could say that we all have is is just doing something wrong ourselves, not worrying about what's going to happen, vehicle related or anything else. And there's a, a myriad of things that can go wrong. Uh, it's it's a it's a risky business, but it's a, a very um, worthwhile endeavor, and uh, it's a it's it's total enjoyment, it's sheer pleasure, it's it's teamwork, it's excitement, it's uh, the 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 leading edge of technology, it's it's uh, it's a foreign environment, it's you know the the risks are worth are worth taking for all of us, and uh, we train extensively. In fact, almost too much for things that go wrong and. and Butch and I and Leland and Comrade as a flight deck crew spend all kinds of time going through all kinds of convoluted, twisted cases of failures of different systems all at the same time and staggered and interrelated and confusing and uh, real brain teasers and they're, they're a lot of fun to work through. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's exciting stuff. It's, it's real dynamic, um, but in eight and a half minutes, at least half your training is gone. And you haven't even gotten into orbit or just basically got into a suborbital trajectory and your, uh, you know, most of the time you spent training is, is, is finished uh, because those, those scenarios didn't pan out or you already took care of it and it was no big deal because you were well trained. Uh, but the thing that, uh, uh, that, that happens more often than not is, is you're in, on orbit for 11 days and you're you're doing one thing after another and they're all different and you didn't have uh extent you you're trained well but you there's so much that you need to learn that you just got to pick it up and do it uh, you're always more concerned with with doing something uh, incorrect that way and usually the impacts aren't so bad but uh the time spent there is uh is not as extensive because we do uh very extensively train for things to go wrong in our dynamic phases of flight, and we're well, repa well prepared for that. So. Thanks for the adult question. <laughs> in a room full of school kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> any other adults want to ask any questions? <laughs> yes. <laughs> what background did you have to prepare yourselves to apply for the job of astronaut? You know, there are probably uh, 100 astronauts working in Houston in our astronaut office in 100 different backgrounds. You know, so we, we each have a little bit varied background. Um, a couple of us, uh, four of us, I guess, naval aviators, uh, including the two Marines. Uh, and no, that's not a slight. It, we, we cherish the Marine Corps uh, part of the naval service. Uh, but... Uh, so four of us. Well, we appreciate uh, the ride you guys give us to go to war, Mike. <laughs> yeah. okay. So uh, some of us, four of us, uh, came through the flight training, naval flight training, and and became pilots and test pilots, and and our but our educational backgrounds are all a little bit different. Um, then we have uh, the two smart guys, Bobby Satcher, especially here on the end, with his PhD and medical degree, and uh, Leland with his background in in the NFL, and then. Uh, He's actually a fiber optics expert, so you can ask him questions about how fiber optics work because he's a, he's a world-renowned expert in fiber optics. We don't bring that up very much, but uh, <laughs> it's the truth. And so, uh, we, you know, on my first flight, we had a veterinarian for our, for our 
true medical officer. This time we had a real doctor, but uh, <laughs> we even we even have have a veterinarian and astronaut. So the backgrounds, you know, we have people with PhDs in chemistry and biology and astrophysics and and a lot of very smart people there. You know, just not very many on this crew. <laughs> Is there internet on the International Space Station? Not yet. Well, they're, they're actually working on that right now. Jeff Williams and TJ Creamer are up there trying to put together a crew land, and that would allow them to do Twitter directly from space as well as uh, surf the internet. So that's coming very soon. Good question. Uh. I'm I'm from Stuart Hobson, and when you said that you grow in, you grow when you're in space, how how tall did you grow? Uh, it varies from person to person, but uh, it can be up to a I few. Didn't grow in. <laughs> no, I, I was very sad. <laughs> Bobby actually got a call from the Washington Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good, good yeah, it uh, it it can be up to a couple of inches, and it, it probably happens because uh, the discs in your spine actually uh, kind of um, they kind of get larger because here on the ground of course there's gravity and it kind of scrunches everything down when you go up in outer space all of a sudden you know that force isn't on you so it just allows your back to to stretch out and so uh, so that's what happens and it, that can actually be a little bit painful so I don't know what Comrades talking about being so comfortable sleeping, but you know, for the first few days or so, you get some back pain because you're, you you are stretching, you're getting in positions that are you're not really used to, and and sometimes that can be uncomfortable. So, um, I guess it's like uh, growing pains, but uh, growing pains for old men. How are you going? How are you going to restock or refuel the space station if there are no if the space shuttle is being retired? There, there's actually uh, uh, the, the space station. Uh, the space station itself has a lot of visiting vehicles that are uh, a part of what we call a traffic plan, or just a, a scheduled uh, plan of, a, of events of vehicles that come up. Uh, the, we have Russian progresses, is what they're called. They're similar to a Soyuz, but they they're basically for restocking. We have a, a European vehicle that's a uh, a uh, a hard, it basically uses the same type of mating mechanism that the progress does. In other words, it comes up and actually uh, hard mates to the, the station uh, itself. And then we uh, will also have a Japanese transfer vehicle that comes up underneath the space station and, and just kind of hovers essentially at about uh, 30 feet. And we actually grab it with a robotic arm and then uh, attach it. And, and these vehicles have a lot of capability for bringing up uh, not only food and equipment, but also uh, gas for, for breathing atmosphere and fuel and everything you need. So uh, we're pretty well equipped that way. Um, I'm a high schooler from Edmund Burke, and I was wondering what the dangers were when you're spacewalking. Like, can you fall off the spaceship? <laughs> Great question. Dangerous spacewalking. Uh, dangers of spacewalking. Uh, we, uh, you know, we take uh, every precaution and we train hours and hours in our pool in Houston before we do these spacewalks. Uh, we always remain tethered to the outside of the space station. I don't know if you saw in the video in one scene you could actually see Randy's um, tether. It's uh, it's like a steel cable and it uh, is always attached to the space station. We, so we we can't uh, float away. Um, but you know, talking about preparing for problems, what could go wrong. We, we trained quite a bit on problems that we could have during our spacewalks, and, and we were pretty lucky, I think, on the whole, because we didn't have very many problems. But uh, Bobby and I had a bolt that was a little uh, hard to, to uh, loosen on, on one of the spacewalks, and, you know, we're, we're working on stuff out there that maybe a, a bolt that was tightened five years ago on the ground and then launched into space, and it's been flying up there for a long time and going through all those thermal cycles going around the earth and uh you know it might be a little tough to uh, loosen those bolts so we prepared quite a bit for for problems and uh we were fortunate we didn't have any but too many but safe for two yeah, safe. yeah and on top of the uh, cable that we uh, stay tethered to 
We also have a, a backpack called SAFER, uh, which is simplified aid for EVA rescue, um, which is basically a nitrogen pack that we wear on our backs. And if we were to somehow come untethered, uh, one of our buddies disconnects us or something, I don't know but how, how that could happen. But Wouldn't be your buddy after that, yeah. right? <laughs> we, we can actually fly back to the space station. We have enough nitrogen in this backpack to fly us back. And that's another thing that we train in the virtual reality laboratory in Houston. We put on goggles and, and uh, you see you're out on the outside of the space station and then they can flip you off and off of the space station and you're tumbling backwards and then you pull out this thing and turn it on and, and fly yourself back. So we, uh, we prepare for, for as many uh, eventualities as we can think of. Okay, and we have time for uh, three more questions, so make sure they're good. <laughs> How many months of training do you have to do before you go into space? How many months of training do we have to go through before we fly in space? We uh, got assigned as a flight uh, in September, and we did some training uh, that fall. And like uh, Scorch said, you know, it was really nine months before the mission. Uh, after the new year, we really got into hot and heavy, full-blooded training. And then we launched in November. So from assignment in September to launch in November, as you can see, was uh, basically 14 months. There uh, used to be you know, a period of time when our missions were a little uh, less complex. Uh, the minimum they ever used to have would be six months. But 12 months is more desired. So that was probably simple. Approximately how many years does it take for all the training in all uh, for one mission? Uh, I think the question is how many months total for one mission? Yeah, basically we'll just uh, round it to a year. It's probably the easiest. So, good question. Um, okay, two more. Uh, what's your favorite part of being in space? You'd probably have to ask each one of us individually. I'll just say being with these guys. That was my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> say, oh yeah, the rock. I got the answer first. Go ahead. You can't top that. <laughs> being in space is fantastic. But I, I didn't think about this ahead of time, but we've been back since the 27th of November. But it has been a joy, almost as equally as enjoyable, to share the experience with others like we're doing today. It's mm -hmm. been really, really great. <laughs> you know, there were times in the mission when everyone's busy running around doing things, but when you saw that part in the video where we were all eating together, that was one of the best times because we had a time to kind of fellowship and get together and talk about our families, talk about the mission and talk about the food. So the eating part was a really, really good time. We, we all got together and it was just a, a great moment. Right, we better go to another question. So after being up in space for a while and then coming back to Earth, was it difficult getting used to gravity again? It was, uh, it was pretty neat uh, actually coming back and kind of uh, being in a known element that you've been in your whole life, coming back to it and feeling a little weird. I think, uh, you know, Bobby and I were talking about it as you saw us walk off the crew transfer vehicle to go walk onto the space shuttle. It felt kind of like you had ankle weights on and you just, you kind of, your, your, or your, you know, uh, shoes were full of sand or something, like you would just gotten wet. But, uh, so you had a little bit of a heavy feeling and then your inner ear wasn't being excited by gravity while you're up there the whole time. All the fluid in there had just kind of stopped. And so now you start moving around and, and everything in your inner starts moving again, you kind of um, it would make your body feel a little bit strange, but that only lasted for a, for a few hours. And so it was uh, surprising how quickly, because your body already knows what 1G is like, how quickly your body got back to, uh, uh, you know, basically back to where you were before you left. Some other funny things that happened there. I remember, I, I remember my first, after my first flight, the first thing I remember uh, that was unique was uh, waking up the next morning after going to bed and not really knowing how to get out. 
because I was used to floating out of my sleeping bag, but I wasn't used to getting out of a bed where I'm laying down. So I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, about, at least I was thinking about it, because otherwise it could have been really ugly. But I thought, all right, <laughs> if I try to do this, I'm going to end up face planting, and that's not going to be a very good dismount from the old bed. So <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm going to move this leg around. So I had to think about it. And other things people come back is sometimes you'll grab like a coffee cup, and instead of Instead of setting it down on something, you'll just let go of it because you're used to letting go of things. And instead of it floating there, it just, I'll say, okay, I'm not in the same place I was anymore. So, um. yeah, but, uh, one of the uh, things they brought up was with, uh, was with the, uh, your balance stuff. And uh, nowadays, they actually do, they test us as soon as we get off of the, the shuttle to see what our balance is like, to see if we're safe driving or, or whatnot, because uh, it, take, it actually takes, a, you know, probably a total of about two days or so for it to completely renormalize. But uh, you're usually in, in good enough shape after a few hours to where you can do most things you normally do. The reason that's so important is someday we're going to leave here, we're going to go in zero G for quite a while and go to other places like the moon and Mars and other places we need to know how to function when we get there. So if you've been on a spaceship for two to three months in zero gravity and you got to go to Mars, well, we can't afford to have you be three days before you can get in the rover and start driving around. So if we can figure out ways to combat that kind of stuff while we're in zero gravity, we'll be able to land on Mars and get right to work. I think that was our last question, and uh, we really do appreciate you all. Um, being so attentive and alert and interesting to, to talk with. Uh, it, flying in space has is, is, uh, truly been a highlight of my career, and I know uh, it has been for most people in our office. Um, but the, you know, the hard work and teamwork is really uh, the, the, the pinnacle of it all. Um, it, it's not what any one of us gets to do or does uh, that really matters. It's what we collectively do. And the space program is probably one of the biz biggest examples of that because there's, you know, not just astronauts, there's not just uh, mission, uh, mission ops people, in other words, the flight controllers and us that work together. It's, it's all across the country. It's, it's all the different centers. It's all the different uh, corporations that participate in making an endeavor like this happen. And uh, it's, a, it's a, uh, a unique experience and to to uh, totally unique event. And it's an extremely worthwhile endeavor, and we're just honored to be a part of it and, and helping to represent NASA as best we can. So, again, thank you. Uh, for doing so well. Thank you guys for sharing the experience of STS 129. So, for the students in the room, here who who here would like to do a spacewalk and, and travel 17,500 miles per hour? Who would like to perhaps uh, command a spaceship to go back to the moon or perhaps to Mars or maybe be a scientist and analyze data from the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, we hope you'll follow the activities of NASA. Uh, we have a busy year ahead of us. As we speak, five crew members are from US, Russia, and Japan are up on the International Space Station. Uh, the budget request for 2011 will be released on February 1. For you students, that's like our allowance from the president. We are anxiously standing by to hear what the president uh, has in mind for the future of NASA's human spaceflight program. We're getting ready for the upcoming launch of STS-130 that's going to go back to the space station. We're also preparing for the launch of the Solar Dynamics Observatory that will reveal how solar activity is generated and how it impacts things here on Earth. And uh, a reminder to headquarters employees, on January 29th, you'll have the opportunity to participate in the annual Day of Remembrance ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, this is our chance to pause and reflect and recognize the sacrifices that the astronauts from Apollo 1 uh, the Challenger mission and the Columbia mission made uh, when they gave their lives for their country. So stay tuned to announcements on NASA Inc. for further details on that. Meanwhile, thanks again to the teachers and students from the Congressional Schools of Virginia, from the Edmund Burke School of Washington, D.C., and from the First District Community Outreach Youth Program. Thank you all for coming today. Please join us in the lobby to meet the astronauts and be sure to pick up materials on the table on your way out. You can learn more about our current and future plans and programs by logging on to www.nasa.gov 
Follow us on our web, our blogs, Twitter accounts, and a range of traditional and social media. Thanks for joining us today, and see you in orbit.